Good evening. Before we get started, it is Luke Bill's birthday, so you gotta say happy birthday. You love you love this moment right now, don't you? You just you know you love just you know to serve out in the open and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, man, Luke is such an asset to this church, the kingdom of God. Uh, just a great, great man. And I was gonna say a great man for your age, but you're a great man for any age. So we're just very. Very thankful for you, and I uh, hope you've had a good birthday. <laughs> hey, let's get into uh, Suit Up. We're in week six, and we've got seven weeks, um, seven pieces of the armor as we see it. Some people say six. We kind of see the seven with prayer there at the end. So next week, we will conclude talking about prayer. Um, and this week, we're talking about uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So let me just kind of review just a little bit about where we've been so far. We talked about the belt of truth and how the belt was put on first for Roman soldiers. And really, the, the truth as believers has to be the foundation for us moving forward. And then the breastplate of righteousness. We talked about how the breastplate would cover the most vital organs, uh, namely the heart. And so... It's very important for us as Christians to protect our hearts, and the way we do that is to focus everything on Christ's righteousness. And then we talked about the gospel shoes and how really the the gospel of peace ties those last two items together. So we talked about that. We talked about the shield of faith and how it was um, it was best used the shield in a group setting. And so our faith being used as a group, like how awesome is that? Whenever there's an enemy coming at us to to be able to put our shields together and go to bat on each other's behalf. And then we talked about the helmet of salvation and how the helmet protects our mind in the spiritual realm. And we're reminded, our salvation reminds us um, that, our, that we can be protected based on our salvation by what we know is true. Now, this week we're going to get into the first item that really isn't a piece of armor. It's more of a, a weapon. And uh, we're going to process through that. Some here, um, uh, some would end here with the sword of the spirit. But again, we're going to end next week with prayer. So there's really kind of two what what could look like offensive kind of weapons here, and uh, and the sword is going to be offensive and defensive. And we'll process through that here in a minute. But let's first go back through the passage, Ephesians six ten through eighteen. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Let's pray as we before we continue. Father, um, I just pray that uh, despite me, you will work here tonight. I pray that this will be your message. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will uh, really just have your way in this environment uh, and speak to us and help us to see you a little more clearly for who you are tonight. We love you very much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's talk about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, if you go back to the Greek, really what it says is um, the sword, which is from the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And that's really important language because the Spirit and the Word of God go hand in hand. And you never really can say, like, I have had this, you know, spiritual awakening. I've had this, this message from God. If that message can't also be found in the scriptures. So when somebody says, man, the Spirit has really spoken to me, then one way you can tell that that wasn't true, if it's in fact not true, is that if it's not scriptural. 
because they will testify to each other. The Spirit will testify to the Word of God, and the Word of God will testify to the Spirit. It's very important. So, why the sword and why the Word of God? Well, let's process through that here tonight. Uh, let's take the Roman soldier sword um, and let's process through that real quick. We were talking about uh, a weapon that went into the belt that could be used, again, offensively or defensively. It could protect any part of your being, and it could also cause a lot of harm to the enemy. It was sharp, it could be piercing, and it's only about 18 inches in length, but it was one of the most dangerous weapons and most helpful weapons in warfare. So we want to process through that here tonight. Um, one of the reasons it was so small, only about 18 inches, is because you wanted to be able to take it with you everywhere you went so that you could be ready for battle. If you've got, you know, just a, a five, six foot long sword, it's going to be very difficult for you to manage your everyday life. So you wanted to be able to have protection, you wanted to be able to have this weapon, and you also wanted to be able to have it function and be able to take it wherever you go. It gave you confidence knowing that you were ready for battle if you had this sword on your person. And so that's the first point here as we talk about the Word of God. To use it offensively is to have confidence knowing that it is with you and ready to be used. And now I don't mean just that you would have your Bible with you everywhere you, you go. Like, you know, you're, you're going on a ride to Dollywood and they'd say, you know, check all your stuff. And you're like, no, i got to keep my Bible right here with me. That's not, that's not what we're talking about here. In fact, in fact, it goes really beyond that. It's more of the idea that we have the Word of God on our mind and at the ready. And that's really important, right? And that reduces the opportunity for attacks to come in. You ever heard the saying that, uh, you know, uh, the, the best defense is a good offense, right? If our, if our minds are focused on the Word of God, if our, if our minds are being actively uh, searching the Scriptures and, and being meditating on them and things like that, then we are really putting on the offensive and we can stamp out anything before it even comes to fruition, and that's why scripture memorization is such a really good tool because it's the, the process of, of rewiring some things so that the attacks don't even get started on you. And that's the point with the football saying, right? If you're, if you're on the offensive, it's very difficult to be on the defensive. If, if, if somebody knows, if they're going to attack you and they know you have the full armor on and you have weapons at the ready, they may be careful to attack you at all. And that's the point here. That's why... That this is an offensive weapon. We can memorize scripture. We can go on the offensive so that these attacks don't even come to fruition. But the problem is, just like I would be with a sword, sometimes people don't want to use the Bible. You know, with a sword, it's like, you know, for me personally, I've, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever even touched a sword, to be honest. I just don't know that I ever have. Um, so there's a little bit of skepticism there for me. Like, I, don't, I, might, I might admire one. I might say, wow, that's a good-looking sword. That seems really cool. Or you might tell me, hey, this sword was used in battle sometime, and it's like a very valuable sword, and I might agree with you that it's very valuable. I might place value on it. But if I don't ever use it, then it's basically irrelevant to my life. And that's the point here. The enemy doesn't care if you admire the Bible value the Bible, even read the Bible, as long as you don't ever use it or apply it to your life. And that's the point here. Once you start picking up this sword and using it and applying these truths to your life, then and only then is he in big trouble. And that's the point here with the sword. Just like the sword, man, the Roman soldiers, they, they would teach kids at a young age to use the sword. You know, and and for a while, it'd be kind of difficult to manage. It'd be kind of awkward at first, you know, holding this sword. And sometimes it may be heavy. And sometimes you'd have to be a bit careful, especially early on, to use it correctly. But, but the more time you spent with it, the more it simply just becomes a part of you. And it stays with you. And it becomes almost like another limb on your body. You're just so familiar with it. You know the old saying... Uh, a Bible that's falling apart is probably being read by somebody who isn't. That's, that's the idea here. I mean, what would it look like for us to become so familiar with our Bible? 
that it is just in us and we're applying it and it just becomes a part of us. And it's not that there won't be pain. In fact, the, the reason people's Bibles are falling apart sometimes is because there is so much pain going on in their life. And they, and they got to go and they got to search the Scripture. But, and, and that's the point here too, right, on the offensive, that the Word of God can go on the offensive against some of these things. Like, um, like Kate said at Barntoberfest, man, when she was sharing her testimony, I don't know if you guys heard this on, on Sunday, but when she was sharing her testimony, she uh, essentially just said, uh, in the name of Jesus, who is the Word of God, by the way, she said, not today, Satan. And, and we don't have to sit around and wait on attacks to come and block them. We can go on the offensive, which is scripture memorization, which is being rooted in the scriptures, like the, like the sword analogy. Man, we just become so comfortable with it. We're just remade in it. We just know it. We're just getting so comfortable with the word of God. So it is offensive. But it also is defensive. Uh, you would use the sword to deflect attacks from your enemy. And Jesus gave us such a great example of this when the enemy tries to attack him. If you, if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew 4. We, we referenced this on Sunday, but we'll read kind of the whole passage here, starting in verse 3. It says, The, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone." Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give, I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Now, see that defense right there. His defense starts with, it is written. The enemy attacks with whatever weapon. He kind of uses different weapons here. Uh, he attacks with whatever weapon he's going to, but Jesus keeps blocking the attacks with, it is written. And then finally, the enemy gets tired of trying him, and he just leaves. That's how the Word of God is our defense. Now, we have to note that the enemy also uses the scriptures here. And that's why he's so crafty. Have you ever just read the scriptures and it, um, it actually leads you even further away from God? Uh, it's happened to me with, with panic disorder. Um, when I would read the scriptures, I would feel more condemned. Um, and that's why we have to understand the key difference here between when the enemy quotes scripture and when Jesus quote scripture here. Here's the key difference. Here's how you can know that your understanding of reading the scriptures is from God and not from the enemy. Remember what we said at the beginning. It is the spirit and it is the word of God both. The spirit was given to us. Let me say that again. The spirit was given to us. We never earned the spirit being in us. That's really important. For us to realize it was not earned. And the Spirit, while He can be convicting at times, He ultimately leads us into life and experiencing ultimate freedom. What the enemy is trying to do here with quoting Scripture is trying to lead Jesus, like we talked about on Sunday, into trying to prove Himself. That's what we talked about Sunday. The emphasis on the doing, if, if, if you want this position, if you really have this position, then you will do blank. So it's not to do things from the position you already have. It's to try and earn a position. That's what the enemy's trying to do here. And that's why it's fundamentally different. And that's why it's the Spirit of God and the Word of God. The Spirit is given freely. We don't do anything to earn God's Spirit in our life. And that's really important. So if we ever read the Scriptures and we start to feel condemned... We can simply say, 
it is written. John 3, 17, for, for God sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that it might be saved through him. That's the difference. That's the separation. That's why it's the spirit of God and the word of God both. And man, the enemy will. He'll, he'll try to, to get us to read the scriptures through a lens of condemnation, through a lens of trying to earn something. But we cannot earn what is freely given. So as we read the scriptures, we remember the, the words of Jesus saying, I give them life and no one can snatch them out of my hand. The enemy wants you to read the scriptures while ducking your head. While saying, I just got to get things right. Or I'm not good enough. Or I worry that I'm not doing enough for God. Or you should be further along than you are right now. There is a heaviness there is a heaviness present. Not a conviction, just a heaviness. Because conviction is from the Lord. Conviction is from the Lord, but condemnation is not. That's why we respond with, it is written. It is written. It is written. When the enemy attacks, we respond with, it is written. And that's why we have to go on the offensive too. That's why we have to know what the scriptures say. We have to have our sword at the ready so that we can say it is written. You know, we could have a billion attacks come our way and, and leave relatively unscathed if we have our armor on. And we could also simply have one attack from the enemy and leave pretty devastated, depending on whether or not we have this armor on. And that's so important. It is not the attacks that dictate the battle. It is really whether or not we have our armor on that dictates the battle. If we have our armor on, he will flee and we will be left standing. Until then, we can expect attack after attack after attack. But if we have our armor on, he will ultimately flee and we will be left standing. You know, when... Uh, David takes his armor off and goes home. He's been fighting in the war. He's had his armor on and stuff. And he goes home and he takes off his armor. And that's really when he gets in big trouble, isn't it? Point being, it is the armor, not the circumstance, that determines our safety. We can go, in, we can go through anything if we have our armor on. We can get that diagnosis and we can, we can mourn about it, and, but we can always mourn with hope. Because we can always say, it is written that he will never leave us or forsake us. He will never abandon us. He loves us. And the scriptures will testify to that reality. We can stand against the schemes of the enemy when his armor is on us. And that's really important for us to believe. As we sort of get to the end, we're almost to the end, not quite, to the end of the series that's really our hope, that if the armor is on, if the full armor is on, then at the end of the day, we can stand. At the end of the day, we can stand. Now, one more thing to get into uh, regarding the Word of God. I believe, as most Christians do, that the Bible is authoritative, true, and sufficient. Uh, but, you know, there are also other religions that believe that they have the Word of God and that it is true and authoritative and sufficient. So the question is, what is the difference? And certainly we can't get to all those differences, but I do want to, to highlight one very important difference. How can we trust that the Bible is the true Word of God? Well, it's John 1 verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. That is the biggest difference to me that separates Christianity from every other way of life. There's something in us that knows that we want to follow a leader who has been where we are, who leads by example. You ever had to, to follow a, a boss that never led by example? It's a hard place to be, isn't it? You ever, you ever had a boss who never had kind of your role or could understand the, the ins and outs of your job? That's a tough place to be. But that will never be the leader that we have in Christ. 
because Christ did come to the earth to dwell with us, to, to give us an example of what it looks like to live the Christian life and to empathize and to put on flesh and to, to mourn and to, and to have the weakness of the flesh. He did all those things on our behalf. And that's the difference. And I don't mean to pick on other religions here tonight, but, but if that's not the case, then there's going to be some level of separation between you and God. If God is like high above us and in, 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 in heaven and doesn't come to the earth, there's going to be some level of separation and inability to empathize with the things that we go through. But Hebrews 4 tells us that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us. And the reason for that is because he stepped down from heaven and made his dwelling among us. That's how we know that this book is the word of God. Because the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. You remember in, in John 13, he says, very simply, this is one of the most staggering statements in all the scriptures. He, he simply says, as I have loved you, love one another. And this is how people will know that you're my disciple. As if to say, you don't have to guess what this looks like. You don't have to guess what love looks like. You, 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 re, you remember the, the night that, that I was to be killed and I decided that my last night I was going to, to wash your feet? You remember that? That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. As I've loved you, love one another. That's the kind of idea I'm talking about. You remember how I didn't ever withhold anything from you? You remember how I was always like, like, here's the kingdom, and here's the keys to the kingdom, and here you can be involved in everything that I'm doing? You, you remember that? That's what I'm talking about when I say love one another. You remember when, when you all just walked away at my most trying time when I really wanted you there most when I was struggling and you walked away but then but then I said throw your net out again I forgive you I'm with you you're going to build this church you remember that you remember that level of forgiveness that's what I'm talking about that's the kind of love that I'm talking about and that's so profound for us as we leave here how can we know that the Bible is true well because the word became flesh and he led us everywhere he wanted us to go. There's never anything that Jesus is going to ask of you that he wasn't willing to do himself. In fact, did himself. And that's the confidence that we can have. And perhaps, if we know that he is with us, we can be prepared for any battle ahead and we can stand. Why? Because we know that he will be standing right there with us in the battle. And that's crucial. And that's how we stand, knowing he's right there with us. He's not just high above us, taking notes on our progress and saying, get it together. It's, I'm here with you. I'm here with you, guiding you. And that's how we know that the Bible is true. That the Bible is true. Let's pray. Father, uh, we thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for the ways you guide us. Father, we thank you that your word can be convicting in the best way, but ultimately your desire is to bring us into life and life to the full. And Father, I pray that as we search the scriptures and as we become a people of your word and as it becomes like another limb to us because we just, we're just in it and we use it and we apply it and we know it, I pray that you'll give us a hedge of protection and understanding away from the enemy so that, so that we'll know that we never have to earn anything that we never have to just feel that weight and pressure that you are the one who's taken it all and we can walk in freedom and we can walk in conviction and repentance, yes, but also that freedom. Father, I pray that you'll make us a people who are, who are never afraid to pick up that sword, that we just, we just want to pick it up and we just know that we can be remade in the reality of who you are through it. And we thank you that you just didn't give us a book, but yet you gave us a book with your words and you also became flesh and made your dwelling among us. And that's just, I mean, I, I don't even know how to put that into words tonight, but we're just so thankful. We love you very much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, let's worship.